we'll primarily be looking at um, a portion of Scripture in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 4. We can go and turn over there to Luke chapter 4. Um, in Boston, <clears throat> for the longest time, well, real estate's so expensive there, um, and so it's probably unlikely the church there will ever own its own meeting place, which means we rent a space uh, for our meeting place typically, um, and we, own it, we rent it from one hour to another hour, which means that my uh, sermons are <laughs> pretty hard to cut off because we're going to be shoot out of here pretty quick because we have, no longer have access to uh, the facilities. Um, I hope not to abuse the fact that this is your place 24-7 and therefore <laughs> have my sermon go much longer than you're typically used to. Uh, we're going to be looking here at Luke chapter 4. Uh, the book of Luke is my favorite book in the Bible. Several years ago, I was at a Bible camp as a young man, and one of the men, his name is Tom Holly, he really encouraged us young guys to be able to adopt a book of the Bible. He said there's a, a real benefit from being able to have a light understanding of the entire scriptures, but he really emphasized the benefit of choosing a single book of the Bible and just really digging in and knowing that book, learning about that book, adopting that book. And so um, the book that I chose to adopt is the book of Luke. I thought that would be helpful since most of my studies are with non-Christians, being able to have one of the Gospels, teaching them about Jesus. And so I just, you know, he said, it's read it every week. And so I read it every week, maybe 30 or 40 weeks, uh, you know, memorized large, large portions of it, being able to understand more about it, read some commentaries on it, made notes on it. It's my favorite book of the Bible to, to be able to study and to teach. Um, and so chapter one of Luke, to give some context to where we're at in chapter four, is a promise made of Jesus, all right? This is when the angel visits both uh, Zechar uh, Zecharias and Mary, saying that uh, both the child would come that would be the prophet or the preparer of the way of Jesus, and then obviously to Mary, your, chi uh, your child will be um, the king, the Messiah. Chapter 2 is the birth of Jesus, self-explanatory. Chapter 3 is the preparation for Jesus. Remember, John the Baptist was given the job. He began baptizing, uh, or he began baptizing um, for repentance, right? And his whole purpose is his job was to prepare the way. And so the way of preparing yourself for Jesus is to repent, to have an attitude of repentance. Approaching Jesus with that sort of mentality is the best thing you can do to prepare yourself for the Lord. And then here... In chapter 4, we've already been through three chapters of Luke, and we've not really been introduced to Jesus as an adult yet. We've seen a snippet of him at 12 years old in chapter 2. But who is this Jesus? All this buildup, who is he exactly? Chapter 4 gives us our first introduction to who this person is. And the format or organization of this chapter is really cool, I think. Uh, throughout chapter 4, we kind of we go on a journey, we go on a road trip with Jesus <laughs> to three different locations. The first third of the chapter, Jesus in the wilderness. The last third of the chapter, Jesus in Capernaum. And the middle portion that we're looking at today is Jesus in Nazareth. Okay? And in each location, we learn something different about Jesus. Jesus in the wilderness is when he's tempted. What do we learn through that example? Jesus is a conqueror of sin. Where everyone else failed, where the Israelites, when they were in the wilderness for 40 years, they failed those exact same tests, even though they had the same scriptures Jesus uses to overcome his testing. Jesus is a conqueror and a victor over sin. So if I want to be a victor over sin, I need Jesus, because he's the one, that, the only one that has done that. And so I can learn from him and he can help me with that. The last third, him in Capernaum, he went to Capernaum, he began teaching, and they were amazed at something. They're amazed because he was teaching as one who had authority, right? So, you know, a prophet says, you know, the Lord says. A preacher says, the Bible says, all right? What does Jesus say? Jesus says, I say. He teaches as one having authority. And so we learn about that. Not only authority in his teaching, but also in his ability to cast out demons and heal sicknesses. He has authority over everything. Therefore, when we approach Jesus, we're not talking to that customer representative that can't really do anything about anything, right? You ever call, you have a problem with your cell phone bill or something like that, 
and you know the person you're first on hold with, you know, just doesn't have the power to do anything, right? It's, it's that person's job is to kind of get your information and try to calm you down and then try to, you know, and then what, what do we say? Uh, I, want to, I want to go to someone higher up. And then you go through several different chain of command. With Jesus, he has the authority. He's not a middleman. He's not someone you talk to that can't give any solutions. He has the authority. Okay. But what do we learn about Jesus in this middle section, this middle portion of, uh, of our chapter here? We learn in this middle uh, portion, uh, we'll read verses um, 16 through, let's say, read 16 through 30 here. And then again, this is Jesus in Nazareth. Um, maybe I'll say just a word or two before we read this text, just to get us looking for something here as we read. In this section, we learn um, about an encounter that Jesus has with people that I think most of us or some of us here can relate to, uh, can relate with. Jesus is speaking to people that he grew up with. He's speaking to people that don't need to be introduced to Jesus because they grew up with Jesus. <laughs> they grew up with Jesus, knowing him since he was a little boy, Right? They saw Jesus as he's growing up as an adolescent and a teenager, as a young adult. Some of these guys even have, you know, furniture in their home uh, or different uh, uh, apply, uh, things around their house that were made by Jesus. These people grew up with Jesus. They were familiar with Jesus' family. They grew up with Jesus. Um, maybe we can relate. Maybe some of us here, maybe most of us here could relate to this idea of growing up with Jesus. You know, we, we weren't an adult the first time we learned of Jesus. We, we were, well, for a lot of us, we were kids. We learned in Sunday school or by our parents. We kind of grew up with Jesus. But the disturbing thing here, and this is a spoiler here, the end of our reading, we're going to learn that those that grew up with Jesus tried to kill him, rejected him, wanted nothing to do with him. So I want us to think about some lessons that we can learn from Jesus' interaction with those who he grew up with, those who had a familiarity from childhood from, from, uh, from, uh, with, with, with him. So let's go read Luke chapter 4. We'll read verses 16 through 30. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power, uh, well, verse 16, and he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words which were falling from his lips. And they were saying, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard was done at Capernaum, do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. But I say to you in truth. There were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, when a great famine came over all the land, and yet Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. And all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage 
as they heard these things, and they got up and drove him out of the city and led him to the brow of the hill on which their city had been built in order to throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went his way. Okay, so uh, we read the ending. We know what happens. These individuals that Jesus, that grew up with Jesus, utterly reject him, seek to kill him. And so I want to know, what are the warnings, perhaps, for us that could relate to these people? Like them, we've grown up with Jesus. So let's look at some of why they reject Jesus. Why do they reject Jesus? And are there any warnings that are relevant to us? The first reason I see, well, let me kind of summarize what, uh, what happens here a little bit. So Jesus comes into his hometown of Nazareth. As was his custom, he goes into the synagogue, a place of worship, a place of reading. The book, uh, the scriptures is handed to him. He reads out of, out of a section of Isaiah, Isaiah 61. And he reads this portion that Jesus essentially is the fixer of broken people. He's come to fix those who are ill or those who, uh, or those who are captive. Um, and to preach um, liberation. And he closed the book and he said, guys, today this is talking about me. I am fif- I, this scripture is fulfilled right now, today, in your hearing. And they're surprised at how they hear responding. They're kind of wondering, because he's speaking these really gracious words, but something is interfering with them accepting these words. And it's this saying, what they were saying in the end of verse 22. Is this not Joseph's son? So why do they reject Jesus? The first thing that I see is because it's hard for those that grow up with Jesus to accept that he's more than they expected. You see, these individuals, they thought they had Jesus figured out. (laughs) They thought they knew him. Yeah, he's Joseph's son. He's this carpenter. He's a nobody just like us. We, We grew up with him. We know who he is. So when he begins speaking in such a way and saying things that are different than what we expect or what we think of him, you have a choice, don't you? (laughs) You can either hold on to what you previously thought, or you can say, I need to adjust my perspective. And those that grow up with Jesus have a hard time adjusting their understanding and perspective of who Jesus can be. All right? Um, The dominating thought had by those who heard him was not upon what he said or what the scriptures stated, but rather they were distracted by their previous evaluation of who they thought Jesus to be. You're Joseph's son. Um, They had these fully formed convictions regarding Jesus. He was nobody, right? But the reality was far different than what they had in their minds. But yet they were so confident in what they already thought of Jesus that they were unwilling to adjust their view of him. What a tragedy. What a tragedy when those that have unparalleled access and exposure to Jesus know him the least. This text says that's possible. It's possible that those around Jesus the most know him the least. Could that be true of me? (laughs) I'm around Jesus. I'm around the Bible. I'm around church. You know, I got these verses on my, you know, plaques on my house. You know, I might have a scripture on my, uh, my cell phone background. You know, I got all these. Th- but it's possible to be around Jesus all the time, but to know actually very little about him. There's another example of this. I'll just reference this. You guys probably, most of you know of this scripture. In Matthew 7, in verses uh, 21 through 23, Jesus says, there'll be many on that day, you know. As it, it says, it, it is not, um, I was going to read it here so I don't, uh, misquote it here. It would be many on that day, on the day of judgment. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> uh, verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father will enter. So he's saying, it's not about just saying, Lord, Lord, but, about, but doing the will of the Father. But then look at verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? 
In your name cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles, and I will declare to them, I never knew you. You think you have a relationship with me, I don't know who you are. (laughs) And there will be many people in the day of judgment that were around Jesus, that grew up with Jesus, but when Jesus is asked, hey, do you know them? I don't have a relationship with them. That's a terrifying thought for me to think about this, right? Um, by the way, that verse is the verse that motivated me to really get serious about my Bible study. Because <laughs> it says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter, but he who knows the will of the Father, or he who does the will of the Father, but you can't do the will of the Father unless you know it. <laughs> so that motivated me to really learn the Bible better. Um, so um, those that grew up with Jesus oftentimes can be the most resistant against adjusting their knowledge of who he is. And I think this happens because we assume that the, the length of time them around something results in a certainty regarding whether or not I know that particular thing, right? But sometimes things that we know the longest are the things that we have the most, biggest misunderstanding about. And this can happen when we're young, when we learn about something that is, isn't, isn't correct, isn't true, but I've thought it that way for so long, I feel confident, I feel certain regarding that. I mean, how many times, you know, if you're asked to draw a picture of the, the temptation of Eve uh, and Adam in the Garden of Eden, how many of us draw an apple? Because we're just, we're told, you know, in Sunday school or all the pictures, you know, that it was an apple. The Bible does not say an apple. It, it isn't, you know, how many times when we think about that nativity scene, those three wise men, it's always three. The Bible never gives a number for how many wise men there were. <laughs> you know, and so these are things that for so, we were, uh, for so long ago we thought, and we've had this, had this idea of these things. Now, those are relatively inconsequential details. But imagine us having that exact same issue when it comes to who Jesus is. What's his character? What's his quality? What's his preferences? What are things that are like big deals to him? But from a young age, I've assumed this is the way he is. This is what he likes, this is what he doesn't like. It's a dangerous thought to think that perhaps we're wrong about those things. So for those that grow up with Jesus or have been exposed to him for a long period of time, our confidence in our knowledge of something can be mistaken as, uh, mistakenly equated to the amount of exposure we've had to those things. All right, well, let's go and look at um, this next reason why they reject Jesus here. And perhaps there are several here. Looking back at our text of Luke chapter 4, notice how Jesus describes their attitude towards him in verse number 23. Jesus said to them, No doubt you will quote this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. (laughs) What kind of attitude is Jesus describing there? Here, look at the quote in verses 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor? To send, uh, to, to proclaim release to the captives? Recovery of sight to the blind? To set free those who are oppressed? And Jesus says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Oh, this is great. We love the idea that Jesus is a savior and a fixer of the broken. But what happens, how do we feel when someone puts the finger on our nose and says, and you're the broken person he came to fix? Whoa, now. (laughs) Jesus is the fixer of all those people, right? The people in Sierra Leone, the people in Boston, the people, you know, my, my neighbor, you know, my coworkers. Jesus is saying this is fulfilled in your hearing, this hearing, right now. Jesus is the Messiah, the fixer, So according to Jesus, who's the broken people? Those that grew up with Jesus. But unfortunately, these people didn't like that perception. Uh, And I think this is common, that those that grow up with Jesus can have a real hard time admitting that they need him. (laughs) A real hard time admitting that we need a fixer. Because after all, I've known Jesus all my life. (laughs) After all, I've I've known all of this. We don't need Jesus' healing. 
can be a sentiment that we might not say out loud, but maybe we say to ourselves when no one's looking or no one's listening. Um, Likewise, this is our problem. Perhaps we don't take seriously our need for Jesus anymore. Perhaps we think of our salvation as being a past event that happened decades ago, and now our current job is simply to stay saved until Jesus comes back. Right? Um, It can be easy for us to separate ourselves from those who desperately need Jesus. We don't take Jesus, uh, our need for Jesus seriously anymore. Um, In my experience, it isn't those who are first introduced to Jesus that are offended when, you know, it is implied that they need they need him, <laughs> that they have areas of fault or flaws in their lives. Typically, the individuals that are most offended at the thought that they need to grow in something or change something are those that grew up with Jesus or feel like they've already passed that. I'm already past the whole fixing part. We are never past the fixing part. All right. <sighs> Um, there was an uh, example of a, a young man uh, in Boston that I got the opportunity to be able to play an influential role in his salvation. And uh, he was um, an agnostic, or I guess atheist. Um, he grew up Jewish, but became kind of atheist. And um, he, he would often share, and he had a really tough background, drug abuse and things like that. And he would go back to his um, this kind of halfway uh, recovery house. Um, and he would talk to the people that saw him at his lowest point before he was a Christian. And he would talk to them. And I said, I know what you're all thinking. You know, uh, back several months ago when I was here, um, I would have told you that religion is for weak, broken people. Jesus is for weak, broken people. Um, you know, and I don't need that. And he told his friends that are there, if you ask me now, Ask me if I change my mind. I say, no, I have not changed my mind. (laughs) I now realize that I am a broken, needy person, right? That's something that we we, we must never let go of, that we need fixing, that we need Jesus. No matter how long we know him, we need him. All right, and so this final warning in verses 25 through 30 Jesus, because of their rejection, because of their hesitancy to adjust their view of him and to accept his fixing, he brings up some examples of Old Testament history. He brings up times in Israel's history where God sent his delivering prophet not to an Israelite, but to foreigners. What's the point? (laughs) The point is, if you're unwilling to up grade, update your view of me, and to receive the healing that I've come to give, I'll go to someone who does, and who is willing. And it is at this point that they clench their fists, they are infuriated, and seek to kill Jesus. That warning is for us as well. If we are unwilling to look at Jesus as he is, not just how we grew, thought he was, or how we grew up being told about him, but reading the scriptures with clarity, with an open eyes, being willing to be surprised by who Jesus is. And then when we encounter something that's different about Jesus than what we thought, instead of throwing that away and turning the other way, updating our perception of who he is, and then being willing to always look in the mirror and see the blemishes and allowing Jesus to fix it. But if we refuse to do that, Jesus will say, okay, I'll go to someone who is willing. And this is a challenging thing, because Jesus leaves Nazareth. With those people who don't want him around, he says, let me oblige. See ya. And uh, in the book of Luke, at least, we never learn of him coming back to Nazareth. So I think this is a challenging thing for us to think about. Because if we reject him, if we're unwilling to update our perspective of him, unwilling to, to uh, um, confess our own flaws and shortcomings in order him, for him to fix, um, we're rejecting him and he might not come back. <laughs> That's a challenging thing. So we need to take an urgent perception, an urgent attitude towards these things. All right, so some final questions for us. Uh, are we willing to admit that we don't know Jesus in his entirety, right? 
the book of Luke. I love this book. The first four verses talks about Theophilus. I've written these things to you so that you may know the certainty regarding the things you've been taught. Theophilus, the person this book is written to, already knew some about Jesus. He didn't know the certainty of it. We need to continue to learn the certainty and the absolute truth of who Jesus is. And if you are someone like that, then this book will be a treasure to you. Okay? Secondly, are we willing to do what the Nazarenes were not to recognize our brokenness and constant need for Jesus? Or will we say, physician, Jesus, find someone else to to heal. Go heal yourself. If we do recognize and are willing to be helped by Jesus, then again, this book will be a treasure to us. will be a hope and confidence that Jesus can fix us. But if we're not, Jesus will leave you just as unchanged as he left the Nazarenes. So if there's a way that we can help you know more about him or be obedient to him, or if there's a blemish in your heart that you are seeking Jesus' help, at, help with, then there are people, there are shepherds here, they're willing to seek and, and are willing to, to listen and be able to hear you out on these things. If there's any need that you have, please come forward as we stand and sing.